Well, this um, is not going to be a nostalgic trip down memory lane. I think the uh, pub night and um, dinner will probably be better venues for that. Um, and uh, it's certainly nothing like an attempt at an official history. It's really just my, my uh, take on our first 20 years, uh, having been here longer now than anyone else who's available. <laughs> the two years before we actually opened our doors. And in fact, uh, I will never forget when Peter Emberley and I first met the incoming pioneer class in the common room, we were both momentarily stunned that two years of planning had actually produced <laughs> 50 or so flesh and blood human beings. <laughs> A remarkable moment, like you really do exist. <laughs> and it, it's really not even going to be about the full 20 years because there are people who joined us in later years who actually are more familiar with the current workings of the program than I am. Um, so I'm really going to just talk about the birth uh, of, of the BHAM from my own perspective. Um, I will note that Peter Eberly and I actually chose all the artwork uh, <laughs> at a museum reproduction store near the Eaton Center in Toronto. I don't know if it still exists. Um, it's a very fine store. <laughs> Peter and I used to joke that if the college ever folded, which, believe me, was a real possibility in the early years, we would sneak in and get the artwork. <laughs> I think it's staying. So, um, since we're a great books program, I'm going to start with an appropriate reference to a great book, namely Aristotle's Politics. In uh, the politics, Aristotle compares monarchy in contrast with self-government on something like the analogy of a master chef versus a potluck dinner. Sometimes, in other words, you feel like Becta, but it can be an off night and you'll still spend a fortune. <laughs> Sometimes you just feel like a plate of lasagna at Cafe Roma and those are hard dishes <laughs> to get wrong. Now, Aristotle believes that a perfect monarch would be best, but very, very rare and could also be a tyrant in disguise. Self-government, by contrast, is more readily available, more inclusive, it allows more people to shine, and like a potluck, it allows for many different kinds of contributions. A more modern version of this would be Edmund Burke versus Thomas Hobbes. According to Burke, a healthy society evolves from the bottom up through historical experience, not from the top down by a master plan like Hobbes' Leviathan. It's prescription and precedent versus what Burke calls abstract rights. There should be room for accident, for muddling through, and for ad hoc solutions. I think the BHUM curriculum can be discussed in these terms. Uh, it is or has been more of a potluck than a master plan, more of an evolution from the bottom up than an imposition from the top down. It may have started as a master plan, we had to start somewhere, but inevitably that master plan was gradually broken down, reshaped, remolded under the impact of each new faculty member we added who brought their own unique set of interests and abilities to the mix. Burke, I think, would have approved. Inevitably, though, as well, there was an element of arbitrariness. Not every plausible text or theme gets equal coverage. Sometimes it gets no coverage. But more of that in a bit. First, I want to talk about the context of the times in which the college was first conceived and brought into being. Now, I apologize immediately for my anachronistic use of the term college. I know it's the BHUM. I know that the formalization of the three degree programs was both inevitable and desirable. But in our first five to 10 years, the history of the BHUM was to a large degree the history of the college as well. 
In my view, the alliance with religion and Greek and Roman studies was never a mere marriage of convenience, but, but intrinsic to the central vision of the curriculum itself. Now, like every other one of these assertions, not everyone agrees. Not, not everyone in the other fields agree. Uh, but, but, but that's how it struck me. I'm still in touch with students from our first years, all the, all the way back to year one, the pioneer class. They have sometimes become personal friends of my wife and I. They have become my colleagues, and we know their partners, and in some cases, their children. Sometimes we vacation together. This is a very sweet experience, like when the children of one's colleagues become first your students, and then eventually your own junior colleagues. But my point for the moment is that these veteran alumni almost invariably refer to the college when they primarily mean the b -hunt. So how are things going in the college? That is what they say to this day. So please bear me if I relapse into this uh, anachronism. So I want to recall two important aspects of the zeitgeist that favored the creation of the college. One is rather pragmatic, having to do with the situation of the university in the 1990s. The other is more edifying, having to do with the debate over the character and survival prospects of liberal education during that same period. I'm going to treat them in reverse order to suggest how an important cultural and intellectual ferment about the future of liberal education happily coincided with a real world period of crucial choices in Ontario universities. The 1980s and 90s saw a spate of books lamenting the decline of traditional liberal education, great books and core texts, under the onslaught of political correctness on the left and the corporate drive to convert higher education to producing hewers of wood and drawers of water for the private sector on the right. <laughs> Different critics assigned more blame to one side and more to the other, but they all were concerned. And you probably know some of these names. In the United States, Alan Bloom, David Bromwich, Christopher Lash, Neil Postman, Camille Paglia, Jean Bethke Elstein, among others. In Canada, years earlier, we had George Grant, later on, Neil Basundeth, more recently, David Livingston. Peter Emberley and I contributed a book to this debate called Bankrupt Education, The Decline of Liberal Education in Canada. This was a kind of manifesto for what became the Center for Liberal Education and Public Affairs, which then became the platform for the College of the Humanities. The college aimed to create a cohesive degree program for the study of the great books. All students would take the core courses over four years, combining them with electives from within the college and the mainstream disciplines. Over time, we made the BHUM compatible with double majors in the mainstream disciplines, which many students wanted. Early on, there was this idea, also very 1990s, that most of our graduates wouldn't go into academia. They would be sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who went into the media, into the private sector, but who had this great uh, liberal education learning. And, and those people, of course, do and did exist, but from early on, many of our students did want conventional academic careers. They did want to go to graduate school in the mainstream uh, disciplines. Now, the college was modeled on a number of such programs, including in the United States, St. John's College, the college at the University of Chicago, James Madison College at Michigan State, directed studies at Yale, and in Canada, King's College Dalhousie, and the Liberal Arts College at Concordia. The aim was to have students discuss the great books in small discussion groups. However, unlike some of these programs, such as St. John's, we decided to accompany these with lectures as they did at Yale. 
we felt that it was too much to ask students to tackle thinkers like Plato and Hegel without some general guidance. Like a lot of the models that we consulted, we also wanted to create a tightly, tightly knit band of students who would take courses together, live together in a common residence, socialize together, and become close friends. That didn't always work out, of course. <laughs> but, um, it, it did feel like a private college from day one. I remember that, that Peter and I were both struck by how this, this atmosphere of a small college seemed to just spring into existence in, in a way that surpassed our um, expectations. Now, um, I'll return to the substance of the curriculum uh, in a moment. First, though, I want to add the other dimension of the opinion climate in Ontario out of which the college um, emerged. The same period that saw widespread ferment about the fate and future of liberal education was also a period of severe financial duress for Ontario universities. In the 1990s, we were hit with the double whammy cuts of Paul Martin at the federal level and the Mike Harris government at the provincial level. Uh, the Harris government demanded performance indicators to prove that universities were really doing their job. They made rumblings about privatizing universities giving public funding only to useful disciplines like the applied sciences while leaving the humanities and social sciences to fend for themselves begging on street corners and, and the like. <laughs> of course, for these people around Harris, privatizing didn't mean private. The government would still actually pick the winners and losers and run everything. Uh, at the end of the day, it was simply too big a cash and patronage pot to give away, just like the LCBO, so they never did. <laughs> right? Every provincial election, both parties float the notion of privatizing the LCBO. As soon as one of them is elected, you don't hear about this again. <laughs> they cannot give up that huge pot of cash. And I believe that even the free market people around Harris couldn't face doing that with the university system either, uh, which you know costs hundreds of millions a year to run. Anyway, at the time, rumors abounded about the Harris government's plan for the exemplary closure of two entire universities to send a salutary shockwave of fear about excessive spending and sloppy standards it was to be somewhat like the Roman practice of decimation in the regions, <laughs> or perhaps like the raising of Carthage with the uh, soil sown with salt afterward. Of the universities most mentioned as candidates for the chopping block, one of them was, guess who? <laughs> Carlton's new president had already responded to this threat by ratcheting up admission standards, excuse me, a task begun by his predecessor, sometimes to opposition from faculty who believed that easy in, hard out was both a matter of social justice and a more realistic assessment of who our clientele really was. Of course, the response to that was, unfortunately, it started to become easy in, easy out. Uh, and, and that's why something has had to be done. Uh, Van Loon persevered, in my view, correctly. He was determined to end Carlton's reputation, fair or otherwise, as last chance you, by raising the standards of meritocracy. It just so happened that Carlton already had one such elite program in place, us. The college, since its inception, had admitted students with very high graduating grades from high school, on a par with the Victorian Gothic campuses ordinarily considered more prestigious. It therefore stood out conveniently as a kind of pilot project for the eventually successful undertaking to raise admission standards across the board. And uh, uh, that period also quietly saw the conversion of our, uh, uh, our, our tenure track positions 
into establishment positions. Um, that, that fact, I think, was kind of lost on a lot of people at the time, but uh, the funding for our original lines was actually considered seed money by the university. Uh, and the idea was that the money for their uh, permanent funding would come from the private sector. Again, this is the era of Peter Drucker and the whole sort of uh, uh, obsession with you know, corporate outreach and so forth. Uh, but um, in fact, um, that brought us a, a, a huge relief from, uh, from, from, from um, uh, insecurity about, about the future of our positions. So in its 20 years of existence, the BHAM has maintained this elite standard for admissions, and it remains the only full four-year baccalaureate in a Cortex program in Canada. It can't be emphasized how much a key to that success was the original master plan for hiring. Phased in over time, four faculty members already at Carlton were to be paired with four new tenure track lines, providing two faculty members for each of the core courses. Now here again, it turned out to be a matter of bottom up, potluck muddling through, when that master plan was inevitably, sh inevitably shaken by the flow of events. Glitches, glitches in funding, changes in curricular priorities, occasional lack of consensus about cross-appointing to other disciplines, and believe it or not, candidates occasionally turning us down. <laughs> the new hires were added fitfully, but over time we did eventually receive the entire complement. Actually, it's been seven in all, one is including one as recently as uh, last year, who is in this room and who is also an alumnus. When I tell colleagues and friends of mine in Canada and the US who are trying to create great books programs on their, at their own universities that we received seven new tenurable positions phased in over time, they are often astonished and certainly envious. Most of these people have to cobble together a core text program out of existing courses, teach on overload, and so forth, and that's why it is so terribly hard to, uh, to get them off the ground. Okay, so how then, in my view, has the curriculum emerged organically over time? It's become willy-nilly under the impact of the people teaching them and their expertise and interests, a combination of the roughly chronological and the roughly thematic. Now, there's no need for me to uh, go into great length in this crowd um, about what those four core courses are. Religion and myth, philosophy and theology, literature and culture, politics and history. I stress roughly because it was not always possible to perfectly match theme to chronology. After all, it's not as if myth and symbol doesn't include themes about individualism and aesthetics, or as if reason and revelation doesn't have implications about politics. In year four, which is primarily about the political theory of modernity, we also revisit issues from all the previous three core courses, making it, we hope, a kind of summing up, returning students from their four-year magic carpet ride <laughs> to their doorsteps in the 21st century. That's in part because many of the ways in which we study the ancients, for example, were originated by 19th century thinkers such as Hegel and Nietzsche. And it can't always be strictly chronological, because to take just one example, one of Hegel's two favorite authors, the other being Rousseau, was Plato. And Hegel's phenomenology of spirit is redolent with the borrowed imagery of Plato, including the image of the cave 
and the divided line. In other words, a thinker from 1400 years previously was of far more influence and relevance for Hegel than any number of the thinkers who lived much closer to him in time, including his own time. But for me, it is just this somewhat imprecise, somewhat shaky fit between chronology and theme that gives the Biham its dynamic, open-ended, never quite finished quality. And I think our students find that uh, stimulating uh, as well. So once again, to me, it validates Burke over Hobbes. It validates the bottom-up, gradual, and somewhat accidental evolution over the intended master plan. This ad hoc approach, of course, was unavoidable from the very outset. You have to imagine that, you know, when we first opened our doors for the first version of Hums 4000, offered by Noel and me, of all people, <laughs> I'm teaching a course suddenly uh, in Myth and Sybil. That was a very busy summer for me, I'm not sure, uh, preparing for this ahead of time. Uh, it sometimes reminds me of those old uh, uh, Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney movies where someone says, hey kids, let's stage a musical in the bar. <laughs> One of the biggest mistakes I ever made was, you know, so like each year we would have to like phase in the course for the first time. So the following year, uh, Professor Laird, myself, Peter Emberley, and so on and so forth, and the pioneer class was getting the first version of each of the courses as they were as they were brought online and I had them again in fourth year and I made the big mistake of one day joking to them that they had been something like guinea pigs for the creation of the program and I never heard the end of this after that whenever they had something to complain about is was we're sick and tired of being treated like guinea pigs. <laughs> now, that brings me to a frequently asked question. How do we know we're teaching all the great books or the right ones? And the answer is, we don't necessarily know. And we can't teach them all. We can't teach every arguable candidate for membership in the canon because no group of human beings could combine the talent and erudition necessary to do so, or at least to do so well. A psychiatrist friend of mine once wanted to know very indignantly, why don't you teach Freud in Hans 4000? And the simple truth, I replied, is that we don't include Freud because none of us knows enough about <laughs> Freud. Depending on who ended up being hired, the BHUM curriculum inevitably opened some doors and closed others. There was one serious consideration given some years back to hiring a specialist in 19th century European literature to be paired with me in teaching German historicist philosophy from Hegel to Heidegger. Imagine how fantastic a course that could have been. <laughs> Reading Rousseau, Hegel, Schiller, and Nietzsche in tandem with Flaubert, Tolstoy, and Dostoevsky. But it just didn't happen. <laughs> However, the course, as it did evolve, inevitably featured important texts and thinkers that that earlier alternative would have had to exclude. We have to frankly acknowledge as well that there's a certain arbitrariness to the canonicity of the canon based upon the popularity of some texts and thinkers over others, and that some of these shifts in popularity are comparatively recent. Think, for example, of Plato's Republic. It's on everyone's list of the greatest of the great books, but its prominence is actually largely a product of the 19th century in England and Germany. Interestingly enough, um, in Germany, the taste for the Republic 
was cultivated by the conservative thinkers of the historical school, while in England, Plato's Republic was uh, celebrated by the philosophical radicals because of its explicitly and overtly uh, uh, political content. It's concerned with a just society. So two di very different paths uh, to, to the enshrinement of, of, of one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, top picks. Again, it's not a master plan. There's a great deal of ad hoc muddling through. Now, there's been a lot of concern expressed recently uh, about uh, uh, attempts to, uh, to halt or to interfere with the study of the great books, such phenomena as trigger warnings on Shakespeare and Homer, uh, safety zones where students can uh, retreat in shocked horror from having read, uh, you know, a Shakespeare play, uh, the, 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 the safety zone at Brown University apparently contains a, a Play-Doh and herbal tea and coloring books for students shocked by reading Homer to restore their shattered nerves. But I wonder if perhaps uh, we don't have quite as much to worry about as it might seem. A recent study of the 10 books most frequently taught at leading American universities was comparatively reassuring. Homer, Plato, Aristotle, Machiavelli, and Kant, Tocqueville are still at the top of the charts. Here I want to mention Peter Emberley's innovation of uh, making the first year course about religious myth and symbol. This was very important to him. Many of the programs we looked at as models begin with the Greek Enlightenment. But I think it's invaluable that we begin with pre-theological sources of religious revelation because that adds much more depth to what the claims of reason over revelation, which were first articulated by the ancient Greeks, really involved, as well as adding depth to our study of attempts by Christian, Jewish, and Muslim theology to achieve a kind of synthesis between revelation and reason, in which reason is, in my view, inevitably subordinate. This encounter between religious revelation and the emergence of reason in the West among the ancient Greeks is also why, from the outset, as I said at the beginning, the connection of the original college great books template with the disciplines of classics and religious studies was an organic one and why many people from those disciplines were among Peter's earliest and most active supporters, although they certainly also included people in history, philosophy, and English. I hope I won't seem too so chauvinistic if I also mention in this connection the prominent role that has been played in the design and evolution of the bee hum from its inception by my field, political theory. Perhaps, I have no proof, to uneven degrees of enthusiasm from some of our colleagues. But it is a striking fact that over the 20 years of our history so far, five of the BHUM faculty and two of our directors to date have been specialists in that area. Strictly speaking, a mere field among others in the discipline of political science but in reality, and not to everyone's liking among those colleagues, possessing certainly in its own mind the attributes of a full-blown discipline. It's not accidental as well that in all of the Canadian and American models I mentioned earlier that we consulted in designing the BHUM, political theorists have also played a prominent role, sometimes a foundational role. It's not difficult to figure out why. There's almost no political science department in North America where political theory is represented that does not include an introduction to the history of political thought lecture course from Plato to the present. We have our own course here, of course, 2300. And that approach comported very readily with what the BHUM was designed to do also. 
Furthermore, uh, Peter and I were always concerned about the need to promote civic education as opposed to politicized education. So the study of civic humanism, the model of the deliberative life of the citizen, the capacity for principled and non-rancorous debate was a leitmotif throughout the great books from ancient times to the modern age that we uh, very much wanted to highlight. Let me hasten to add, though, that all the disciplines represented among the core faculty can toot their own horns in this way and can take some credit for a dazzling array of talent among our alumni, and not just in the academic world, but in law, business, journalism, media, creative literature, art, and music. Now, as I reach my conclusion, I'd like to say a few words about my own approach to liberal education. One of my models has always been the image of the chariot of the soul from Plato's Phaedrus, in which the uh, chariot representing the mind has to establish control over the passions, lest the chariot be derailed from its journey across the starry cosmos. But by the same token, of course, without the energy of those passions, the chariot isn't going anywhere. There has to be a symbiotic cooperation, in other words, between the mind and the passions. Or you might say that under the governorship of the mind, the passions are sublimated and flower in the virtues. This balance of the life of the mind uh, over the rest of the soul is iterated in many ways down through the ages. Take the dream of Scipio, for example, uh, in which uh, Cicero argues that the best way of life is one in which civic virtue is ranked higher than martial virtue, but the life of the mind and liberal studies is ranked higher than them both. This way of life, according to Cicero, sums up, quote, everything that entitles a man to praise. Liberal education is not about knowing the right answers. It's about an apprenticeship in the art of asking the right questions. What I would term a high or noble relativism that attempts to soar above both narrow-minded dogmatism and the vulgar relativism that assumes as a dogma that every opinion is equal to every other opinion. It's an education that lasts one's whole life, an education that I, and I'm sure my colleagues, have received and continue to receive precisely through attempting to be educators for our students. I have always believed that the great books sell themselves to spirited and persevering young minds. All you need to do as a teacher is to act as a conduit for these books, to enable students to immerse themselves in these books without interference or distraction. You're not teaching them in the sense of implanting data in them what Nietzsche called the indigestible knowledge stones of rote learning. <laughs> you are getting out of the way to let them grasp the treasures and beauties of the canon. That journey can be full of wonders, and as a teacher, you have the privilege of being a travel guide. As Hegel wrote, Bildung, true education, is not the memorization of factual data from the dead hand of tradition. It's a dynamic interaction between us as readers, listeners, or viewers of the greatest philosophy, literature, art, and music of the past. An interaction that unlocks the accumulation of moral, intellectual, and spiritual energies that are our common heritage, crystallizing them in an encounter with understandings of life that are at once both strangely and bewitchingly ancient and yet astonishingly fresh and vital for us now. To take another Hegelian type example, it's precisely by reading how Sophocles and Kant 
clash with each other intransigently over their view of the ethical, that you will learn more about both. That's why the very contradictions are an enriching experience. Hegel agrees with Plato that learning is remembering. He actually uses exactly the same t term in another knowing allusion uh, to Platonic thought. It's the spark that unlocks what already dwells within us. It is not only about the intellect, but an, er an erotic ascent that is simultaneously <coughs> intellectually, emotionally, and aesthetically fulfilling. The great books, in other words, are therapeutic. But we need teachers to let <coughs> us know just how much there is to remember in an age that frequently values nothing that happened before a week ago. A student once said to me, it seems to me that German idealism is all about remembering. I thought that was a very insightful remark. Or as, as Schiller put it, the Greeks felt and we feel the Greeks. The Greeks somehow had this shining, immediate access to life and its wonders, and we in their wake reflect on what they felt and try to feel what they feel. They somehow had the naive access to being, as Schiller would put it. We have the sentimental, to use Schiller's terms, that is to say self-conscious, self-reflecting, and therefore self-doubting access to that same reality through the medium of the Greeks. Or as Heidegger puts it, we stand at a crossroads in the West where we can now <coughs> re-engage the road not taken, re-encounter the ancients in a way not encrusted with doctrines of progress or a thousand layers of interpretation. It would take me hours to recount how much I have learned from my students over the years and in particular, how much I have learned from my colleagues, some of whom I am privileged to count among my close friends, and all of whom are in their different ways outstanding. Going back over the years, I remember numerous wonderful conversations about the great books with my colleagues, sometimes in the class or the corridor, but just as often over dinner or in the wee small hours, sometimes in the very, very <laughs> small hours, also known as dawn. <laughs> we should never be complacent or self-satisfied about our mission, but I do think collectively the faculty and alumni, together with the mentors and our other friends and supporters and our current students, can take a justifiable degree of pride in what we have accomplished together over, the, over our first 20 years. Creating an elite program in a large public research university is no small feat. In a way, it's amazing that we have survived so far, but I am certain that we are here to stay. It's been an honor to serve with you all and an honor to be able to share my take on our history this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>